Okay, so here we are back from our break. And we're still talking about Yates. And uh, now what I'd like to do, if we can go to the PowerPoint, please, is I'd like to talk a little bit about the shock of the new. We've talked about the newness of the new and the valuing of the newness of the new and the tension with tradition. But there also is, in much of modernist art and literature, a deliberate effort to give us a kind of shock of the new, a kind of jarring. Now, in the case of Leda and the Swan, as we're going to see, we actually have a very sexual kind of, of occurrence taking place. Once again, Yeats goes back to the tradition, but he does something very unusual with the tradition. Now, last time I was talking about how you could have experimentalism both in form and in content. And we've talked a good deal about experimentation with form, but also think about experimentation with content. And the kind of thing that we have in Leda and the Swan, you just don't have in earlier poetic tradition. So let's look at it. A sudden blow, the great wings beating still above the staggering girl, her thighs caressed by the dark webs, her nape caught in his bill. He holds her helpless breast upon his breast. Now, one of the things, and you can see this in the, uh, in the footnote, by the way, but one of the things that we know, of course, from the study of, of Greek mythology is that Zeus, who is married to Hera, by the way, was frequently seeking out uh, earthly women in order to, uh, to have sexual relations with them. But because he didn't want to be caught by Hera, he would often assume other forms. And in this case, he has assumed the form of a swan who comes down to this earthly woman, Leda. So we have, once again, a sudden blow. The great wings, this is the wings of the swan, of course, beating still above the staggering girl. Her thighs caressed by the dark webs. These would be the webbed feet of the bird, of course. Her nape caught in his bill. He holds her helpless breast upon his breast. How can those terrified, vague fingers, hers, push the feathered glory from her loosening thighs? And how can body, laid in that white rush, but feel the strange heart beating where it lies? A shudder in the loins engenders there the broken wall, the burning roof and tower, and Agamemnon dead, being so caught up, so mastered by the brute blood of the air, did she put on his knowledge with his power before the indifferent beak could let her drop? Well, notice that, first of all, this is a sonnet, isn't it? This is a sonnet. A sonnet is a 14-line poem, and the Italian form or Petrarchan form of the sonnet is divided up so that there will be an octave that's eight lines. Here the octave really consists of, uh, of two quartets or, or four line stanzas. And then you have six lines, okay? And there are various ways in which this pattern can be varied. And of course, obviously, Yeats is varying the traditional patterns here. But once again, notice that this is the varying of the pattern, the, the tension with the tradition that we were talking about before we took our break. And notice also that what comes starting in line nine, a shutter in the lines engenders there the broken wall, the burning roof and tower, and Agamemnon dead, which of course is reference to the great epic of Troy. 
as told, of course, most famously by Homer. Okay, so the broken wall, you know, eventually the Greeks do get into Troy. It's true that they get into Troy through the trick of the Trojan horse, but nonetheless, once they have gotten into the gates or through the gates of Troy, we have the destruction of Troy, the broken wall, the burning roof, and tower, and Agamemnon dead. He's one of the Greeks who comes back after the war is over, and then he's killed by his wife and his wife's lover. So notice that what's happening here in Leda and the Swan is not only is this young woman, Leda, being attacked by the swan, so that there's obviously sexual intercourse going on here, that by itself is part of the shock of the new I was talking about just a few moments ago. Because notice, this is in the early 1920s. I mean, you can't imagine that there would be very much in the way of poetry circulated. I'm not talking about pornography now, but I'm talking about poetry circulated in such a way as to be taken seriously as art that would deal so explicitly with a kind of sexual encounter. So that's part of the shock of the new. But also notice that there is this historical reference. And from this union, by the way, we're going to have Helen, Helen of Troy, and Clytemnestra, who is the wife of Agamemnon. So uh, this becomes a historic event, which from Yeats's point of view is going to usher in yet another new phase of history. OK, so we think about Leda and the Swan in terms of the images of sexual power that are being exercised here as part of that modernist shock of the new. But then let's turn to sailing to Byzantium. And in sailing to Byzantium, once again, we have reference to sexual behavior, except that here we have images of sexual anxiety, of sexual anxiety. So Byzantium. Byzantium was what? Anybody know? It was the seat of the Byzantine Empire. OK, remember that uh, the Roman Empire at one point was divided into the Eastern Empire and the Western Empire. And then the Western Empire collapsed under the so-called barbarian invasions. But the Eastern Empire continued. The so-called Byzantine Empire continued. And it continued for another 1,000 years after the Western Empire, the Roman Empire, had collapsed. And so it produced this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful artistic tradition in which particularly we think of the icons, right? The beautiful, beautiful icons that are produced by the Greek and Russian Orthodox Christian <laughs> artists. Uh, we have some marvelous examples here in Houston. Uh, for example, the Byzantine Chapel over in the Montrose area, over by the University of St. Thomas and, and uh, the Rothko Chapel and the Menil Museum in that area, the Byzantine Chapel. If you haven't been there, please go. Beautiful, beautiful uh, chapel, a reconstruction of an actual medieval Byzantine chapel. And you have... Uh, these, these icons, you've got, uh, you know, well, let me not just talk about that one in particular, but, but icons typically will have a gold leaf background 
without much, if any, usually not any, background in our usual sense of background. I mean, there are no trees or houses or rivers or mountains or anything like that in the background. There's simply the image of the figure or figures that are central to the icon. And so you'll have, say, Christ, or you'll have the Virgin Mary and maybe the Christ child or something or other like that. And uh, they will have a sense of timelessness because they are simply set within a gold setting, OK? without there being any sense of a world around them. They are out of time and, in a sense, out of space. And these were some of the ideals of that kind of Byzantine art. And Byzantine religion, by the way. You know, Orthodox Christian religion. I mean, when I say Orthodox Christian, I mean Greek and Russian Orthodox. OK, sailing to Byzantium. That is no country for old men. The young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song, the salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, fish, flesh, or fowl commend all summer long, whatever is begotten, born, and dies, caught in that sensual music, all neglect, all neglect monuments of unaging intellect. That's no, no country for, for old men. And then we have all of these images of sensuality, sexuality, fecundity, reproduction, and caught in that sensual music, all neglect, these are the young, in one another's arms, all neglect monuments of unaging intellect. An aged man is but a paltry thing. Yeats wasn't that old, by the way, but he was beginning to feel old. And so we have, an aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, a tattered, a tattered coat upon a stick, like a scarecrow. Unless, unless soul, the body is going, but there's still the soul, unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress, the mortal dress being the body. Okay, so we've got a kind of dualism here of soul or spirit and body. The body is giving way as he ages, but there's still hope. Soul can still rise up, clap its hands, sing, and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress, the body. Nor is there singing school, but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore, I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. In imagination, in imagination, not necessarily in real life. O sages standing in God's holy fire. These are the saints. Okay, and prophets, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, the uh, many of these uh, works of art are actually mosaics, which are little tiles or tile-like uh, uh, pieces, all put together in order to create, particularly on a wall, to create a picture as in the gold mosaic of a wall. Come from the holy fire, pern in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. And, this is a terrible image of aging, by the way, fastened to a dying animal. Okay, my soul is fastened to a dying animal. 
the dying animal being the body. It knows not what it is and gather me into the artifice of eternity, not eternity, but the artifice of eternity, which is to say the work of art into the aesthetic realm, which is somehow beyond time and beyond space, but especially beyond time. As in Keats's ode on a Grecian urn, remember that? How if one could enter the world of the Grecian urn, one would be outside of time because one would be in a space that only exists in a timelessness that only exists in the work of art, right? In which the young people never get any older. They continue to desire what they desire, right? Because that will go on for all eternity. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing. Okay, he's talking about, in effect, reincarnation, right? Once out of nature, out of my natural form, which is my body, and if I'm out of it, would be through death, right? And my spirit now shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake, or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. You see, that's what I would like to be. I would like to be a form such as would exist in art and could only exist in art. Well, okay, very, very interesting uh, poet. And let's see, before we actually begin talking about T.S. Eliot, <clears throat> and I know that this is not on our, uh, on our usual schedule, but I want to, uh, to draw your attention to it. Uh, the poem entitled Crazy Jane Talks to the Bishop, because this takes us to yet another and final phase in Yeats's poetic career. He wrote this towards the end of his life. Okay, everybody with me? Crazy Jane with the bishop. He has a bunch of Crazy Jane poems. Crazy Jane is, is uh, the speaker in a lot of these poems. Okay. I met the bishop on the road, and much said he and I. This is Crazy Jane speaking, by the way. I met the bishop on the road, and much said he and I. Those breasts are flat and fallen now. Those veins must soon be dry. Live in a heavenly mansion, not in some foul sty. That's the bishop talking to her. She's now an old woman. So come live in the church. Fair and foul are near of kin, and fair needs foul, I cried in response to the bishop. My friends are gone, but that's a truth, nor a grave, nor a bed denied, learned in bodily lowliness and in the heart's pride. A woman can be proud and stiff when on love intent, but love has pitched his mansion in the place of excrement, and nothing can be soul or whole that has not been rent. Well, okay. Um, just an amusing little poem in which you have the woman as a kind of satirist. And that's true in a lot of very, very early poetry of the North, uh, particularly the Scandinavian poetry of the North, uh, which would have existed also in Ireland because the Scandinavians were for some time in the coastal areas particularly of Ireland. So there's that older tradition for the woman as satirical poet. Uh, and here, of course, she has 
no love for and certainly no respect for the bishop, who otherwise you would assume would be an object of respect in the community. Okay, so now let's go to Mr. Elliot and let's spend some time looking at the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Okay, let me just make sure I've got this right. Okay, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Very, very, very famous poem. By the way, there used to be a bar here in Houston, which was called Proof Rocks, and they had lines from the poem around the, uh, the, the top of the, uh, the walls throughout this. It was an old house, originally an old house, and it sort of rambled on and had lots of rooms. And uh, so here we are, the love song of J. Alfred Proof Rock. And it was published written and then published before World War I. And this is at a point at which modernism is just really beginning to get going. And then, of course, after World War I, it just explodes. So we have in this poem modernist experimentalism in both form and content. We're going to see examples of that in just a few minutes here. We have an extended monologue because the speaker throughout the poem is the, uh, the principal character in the poem. So we have an extended monologue. We have seen poems before that are monologues, sometimes even extended monologues, such as in Browning, right? Remember Browning? Where we had um, O Fra Lippo Lippi and Caliban upon Setebos, and uh, we had Ferrara talking about my last duchess. And those were all monologues, except they were dramatic monologues. Well, let's, let's see this. The unity here, the unity of the poem, derives not so much from its overall structure as from the persona and voice of Prufrock. The persona and the voice of Prufrock. And like much modernist art, it will not have a smooth coherence in development. Now, think of Cubist painting wish I had a picture here that I could show you as an example of what I'm talking about. Think of Cubist painting, such as some of the famous paintings of Picasso's. And what do you have? You don't have figures that are represented, first of all, the way people or animals and so forth are represented to our eyes in real life, right? You'll have them with the you know, the eyes coming around like this, or, you know, and the, the left arm, see, like if I were turned around this way towards you, the left arm might be coming out of another part of my body where you would not expect an arm to be coming out of, and so forth. Because one of the things that Picasso was experimenting with was breaking up traditional form and rearranging it in new patterns which, among other things, would invoke certain new patterns of perception. How do we perceive the world? Now, in the case of literature, frequently you will have narratives or other kinds of literature, but let's just talk about narrative for the moment, in which things are not smooth, are not connected, are not coherent in our usual sense of coherence, in which we may jump from one impression, or one piece, or one moment, or one place, to another, seemingly without transition, or sometimes truly without transition. So then what holds it all together? 
Well, let's see. I'm suggesting that what holds it all together is the persona and the voice of Prufrock as the speaker. Well, we have an epigraph which, as the footnote points out to us, is from Dante's Inferno. Eliot, like many of his contemporaries, was fascinated with Dante. And then we begin the poem proper. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. There are lots of lines in this too. I know I keep saying this you know, about Yeats. Now I'm going to be saying it about Eliot. There are lots of very famous lines and passages in this poem. You may have heard some of these before. And maybe you knew where they were from. Maybe you didn't. Here they are. So let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky. The evening spread out against the sky, as with the sunset, like a patient etherized upon a table. Etherized, as with ether, a general anesthetic. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Now that's not the kind of imagery that you would find in Elizabethan sonnets. And it's not the kind of imagery that you would find in an Alexander Pope because it would violate his sense of decorum unless he was writing some kind of scurrilous satire. It's not the kind of poetic diction that we find in Wordsworth or Shelley or Keats, right? This is a new kind of language for poetry. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. Well, what we're going to be learning about Prufrock here is that he never really wants to think very deeply about things. He never really wants to take any kinds of risks or chances. He's, he's a very cautious person to the point of his caution being really a kind of fault. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. It's a very famous pair of lines, right? In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. Just sort of chatting about Michelangelo. This is, this is Eliot's image of what is happening to the modern world. And what he's going to do here, he will do even more strongly in the wasteland that we're going to be looking at in our next class. Eliot's view of things is that the modern world is going to hell in a handbasket. Everything is coming apart. Remember, we saw a little bit of that in Yeats, too, didn't we? Everything's coming apart. The modern world is simply disintegrating. And a great civilization is simply coming apart and is disintegrating. Okay? And it's simply given now to superficial trivialities, even in the world of art. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. So notice the fog is presented to us metaphorically, isn't it? 
as if it were a cat, right? The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, and so forth, curled once about the house and fell asleep. That's an amazing metaphor, isn't it? For the, for the movement of the fog in the evening. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. To prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. To get yourself ready to meet the world. There will be time to murder and create and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me and time yet for a hundred indecisions. Time yet for a hundred indecisions. Indecisions. And for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of toast and tea. Okay, this is life reduced to triviality. There's nothing but time and time and time to do all of the trivial things that J. Alfred Prufrock is going to do to fill up the emptiness of his life. Notice time yet for a hundred indecisions. He can still make many indecisions. He can still be indecisive for hours on end. And for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. Okay. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? And of course, he's not going to dare anything. Okay, He's not going to step out, as we say. Time to turn back and descend the stair. Okay, Rather than walking up the stairs to meet someone. You know, is there still time? I mean, I, I can always turn back. I can change my decision. Do I dare? With a bald spot in the middle of my hair, they will say, how his hair is growing thin. Notice what he's worried about. He's got some kind of bald spot that's beginning to develop in his head. And so, you know, will, will people notice this? You know, can I do a comb over so that I can cover this up somehow. Um, but then will people say how his hair is growing thin? Notice he's very concerned about how he's going to appear to others and what they may say about him. Right? Not about what he is. This, this person doesn't have any sense of oh, searching for you know, some kind of profound identity. My morning coat, a morning coat. People still wear these, men wear these still at uh, formal weddings. A morning coat is that long cutaway coat, okay? And then you'd wear a vest with it or a waistcoat and uh, then a, a collar, a high collar, starched collar, okay, with a cravat, okay? And that's still done at formal weddings. Right? You know what I'm talking about. You've, you don't know what I'm talking about? You've never been to a formal wedding? Okay. Okay, well, maybe people wear other things. But this is, this is frequently done anyway. It, during, this is for a day wedding, not a night wedding. But for a, day, for a night wedding in a formal uh, wedding, you'd probably have the men would be wearing tuxedos or something, or some kind of formal wear like that. This is day formal wear. Okay, that's why it's called a morning coat. Um, okay, but it, at a certain time in the past, 
gentlemen would wear these things when they would go out of the house. And they'd be going down the street and they'd have their hats on, you know, and uh, they'd have their walking sticks and they'd be wearing their morning coats and they'd have their vests and their cravats and their starch collars and, and cuffs and whatnot. And so my morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, the old fashioned collar, starched up to here, you know, the ones that would, were removable and, uh, and you'd button them on. My necktie, rich and modest. It's both rich and modest. Okay. Tastefully so. But asserted by a simple pin, a simple tie pin to hold it in place. They will say, oh my God, once again, they will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Oh yes, he cuts an elegant figure in his outfit here, but his hair is growing thin, or how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? And of course the answer is no, that he does not dare disturb the universe, or even the smallest part of it. In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse, okay? He's constantly indecisive. For I've known them all, already. Known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. And this is a very famous line. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. How many of us have done that? You know, that's one of the things, of course, that Eliot is suggesting here. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. Just totally meaningless rituals. And of course, this guy has never dared to reach for anything beyond. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? The, the voice is dying with a dying fall. That is to say, you're in one room, and you can hear people in the next room, and they're lowering their voices. And are they doing so because they're talking about you? That's all this guy can think about, right? And of course, for Eliot, this is an ironic image of what we moderns have become. We no longer have any sense of, of real strength and real energy and real heroism and real courage and real ability to make decisions and to live decisively. And I have known the eyes already, known them all. The eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. Oh, he's a such and such, and she's a such and such. The formulated phrase. Reducing people just to the formulated phrases. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, like a butterfly or other insect. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this or not, but people who have butterfly collections, they're sprawling on a pin, right? Mounted, that's the image here. When I am pinned and wriggling on the wall by what people say about me with their formulating me in formulated phrases, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? The butt ends being butt ends of cigarettes and cigars of my days and ways. And how should I presume? This is somebody who will not presume anything or on anyone. 
And I have known the arms already, known them all. Arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight, downed with light brown hair. He's talking about women, right? Attractive women. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl? And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Notice that while he finds these women attractive, he could not possibly presume to go up to them or to try to speak to them. And how should I begin? Okay. See what I'm getting at? Over and over and over again, we have these images of someone who cannot make up his mind really to do anything and can't ever step out. And that this becomes the image of what is happening to the modern world. Okay. Remember Yeats's the best lack all convention, conviction. Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. And then this is another very famous image. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. Well, okay. A pair of ragged claws, like a crab or a lobster or something like that, some other crustacean, scuttling across the floors of silent seas. Okay. Then there wouldn't have been any expectations at all for me or for what I might be or for what I might become or for what I have not become. And the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers. That's a wonderful image. The afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers. Asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. This is the afternoon, the evening. He's talking about the passing of time. And notice the metaphors that he uses here. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? After tea and cakes, you know the British custom of having their tea, taking tea, which is typically around four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, after tea and cakes and ices, this is a formal kind of meeting. Have the strength to force the moment to its crisis. So that if we're talking about a woman here, could he force the moment to its crisis? Could he actually step out? Could he actually say something to the woman about how he might feel about her or even for her? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, notice he's preoccupied with his appearance grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter. I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. And of course, once again, the reference, of course, is to the biblical story, you know, about uh, John the Baptist. But in addition to that, notice it's the same kind of thing that we saw earlier when he was talking about being like a butterfly sprawled, wriggling on a pin on the wall. Here, here, even though he has wept and fasted, wept and prayed, and what we're expecting is something like the, uh, the holy men and women who went out into the Egyptian desert 
to live lives of heroic spirituality, who wept and fasted, wept and prayed. But here we have him for what? Simply for the strength to approach the woman to whom he may feel some kind of attraction. Okay, though I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, brought in on a platter. Okay, I've seen my head brought in on a platter by the way people look at me, the way people talk about me. They have, in effect, beheaded me. And now I'm simply a specimen for them to converse about. But even then, he has that self-consciousness about the fact that he's growing bald. I'm no prophet, you see. I'm not somebody who could really be a heroic figure in the way John the Baptist was a heroic figure. And here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker. If ever I had a chance to be somebody, I saw it flicker. And I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. Even when I had my moment, I might have reached out. I might have done something really significant, really important, maybe even really heroic, maybe even really great. There's just a flickering of that possibility. But what? I've seen the eternal footman, death, right? An image of death. Hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. I was afraid really even to venture anything. Notice, by the way, what Eliot is doing with rhyme. The lines are, are uneven lines, aren't they? This is free verse. But then notice how he will sometimes have rhymes, as here. And he does also, at some other points here in this particular uh, stanza. Okay, fingers malingers, ices crisis, platter, matter, flicker, snicker. But notice that we don't just have a pattern of rhyming couplets, do we? Because there are other lines here where there are no end rhymes. OK. And would it have been worth it after all? After the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain. You see, this is tea time stuff, right? With the tea set. After the cups, the teacups, the marmalade used to spread on the scones, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead. Come back to tell you all. I shall tell you all. If one settling a pillow by her head should say, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. Okay? I mean, would it have been worthwhile if I had actually concentrated all of my energies at that moment and really come forward with how I really feel and taken all of the risks involved in that. Okay? But what if her only response is to settle a pillow by her head and to say, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. In other words, just casual, even bored indifference. And so, of course, hearing that 
in his own head, he's not going to make any kind of advance. And would it have been worth it, after all, would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this and so much more, would it have been worth it? It is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen. A magic lantern was what they called a, uh, it was like an early projector. An early projector. They, they had these projecting uh, devices that would have candles in them. And then you could put in front of the, uh, the candle in this device. Uh, oh, for us, it would be like a slide, but it would be some kind of an image that then would be projected onto a wall or onto a screen. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. See, what he's asking is, would it have been worth it if I had stepped out, if I had taken my chances with the woman? If her only response was settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window, presumably away from him, not interested at all in him, should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. In other words, you know, somehow or another I've missed communicating with her at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. Am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt, an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times, the fool. Well, what's he talking about here? He makes his reference to Hamlet, which is our big clue, right? Uh, and he's talking about the kind of character that you could find in Shakespearean drama, not just in Hamlet, but in Shakespearean drama more, and, and Renaissance drama more generally. Uh, I'm not a Prince Hamlet. I'm not a heroic figure. I'm not even a tragic heroic figure. I mean, in one sense, the, the tragedy of Prufrock is that he can't be tragic in any true or truly heroic sense of the term. He's indecisive. He's superficial. He doesn't dare to take any kinds of chances, even relatively safe chances, or ones that certainly would not lead to any great pain, even if he didn't get what he wanted. Um, so, no, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. Am an attendant lord. In Renaissance drama, you frequently have somebody who is an attendant lord, somebody who attends upon the king or attends upon the prince. And what is the function of that character in the play or even in the court that is being represented in the play? Well, that he simply is an attendant, first of all, and therefore may make things happen by virtue of perhaps taking messages from the prince to somebody else in the court. Okay, am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two. So you have minor functions in the play, 
not be the hero of the play, but a minor functionary in the play. Advise the prince, not be a prince, but perhaps at times have the opportunity to advise the prince. And again, this would be simply a minor functionary in a play, wouldn't it? No doubt an easy tool. One of the points of Renaissance drama was that certain figures could be used as tools by others. You know Machiavelli? I mean, everybody has heard at least of Machiavelli. Uh, Machiavelli's Prince. And Machiavelli in The Prince talks about how the, uh, the prince, il principe, the Italian word for the leader, really, not, not prince in our sense of the son of a king, but the one who's, who is the principal person, okay? Um, how the only thing that really matters is getting power and once having gotten power, holding on to it. And it's a very cynical view of power. That's all that matters. And any means by which you can get power and hold on to it once you've gotten it will be justified because the end, holding on to power, justifies the means, any means. However, it is frequently useful for the prince, according to Machiavelli, to pretend to be moral, to pretend to be religious, in other words, to be hypocritical for accomplishing a particular end. And one of these devices is to use somebody else as a tool. Somebody else as a tool to carry out some kind of heinous action, like having somebody killed, let's say. OK, this came to be a stock character in Renaissance drama and was known as the Machiavellian tool villain. So here, once again, he's simply talking about how he could provide and fulfill a minor plot function in a play, but he could never really be the hero of the play. Deferential, deferential to the the prince, glad to be of use, politic, cautious of course, of course, meticulous, full of high sentence, full of high sounding wisdom, but a bit obtuse, you know, a bit sort of silly. At times, indeed, almost ridiculous. Almost at times, the fool. Anybody know what that's a reference to? That's a good, that's a good guess. Actually, it's Hamlet. But um, do you have an idea of who it might be in Hamlet? Coleridge was the first one. Remember Coleridge? Our friend Samuel Taylor Coleridge earlier on, romantic poet and critic, and I said that he made uh, lectures on Shakespeare that taken as a body constitute one of the most important bodies of Shakespearean criticism ever and extremely influential. Well, Coleridge came up with this idea about Polonius. Remember Polonius? Polonius is the um, is a sort of chamberlain uh, in Denmark under the king and queen of Denmark. And he's the one who carries out their bidding. He offers advice. He's cautious. He's meticulous. Just as Prufrock describes himself here. But he's also full of high sentence. I don't know if you remember or not, but there's a speech that he gives to his son Laertes when Laertes is going off to the university in Paris. And he talks about neither a borrower nor a lender be and all this sort of you know, stuff and, and, and high sounding nonsense. And uh, he sounds like a silly, stuffy old man. 
Okay, this is just passing on one cliche after another cliche after another cliche to his young son. And as a matter of fact, in at least one production, and I'm thinking now of Olivier's production, Olivier not only starred in the, uh, in the film version uh, that bears his name, but also he directed it. And what he does in that scene is he has the Polonius character delivering those lines, and he has Laertes, his son, trying to keep a straight face, while the daughter, Ophelia, Laertes' sister, behind her father's back is making faces at, uh, at Laertes. And of course, he's almost, but not quite cracking up in front of his father, because what they're making fun of is they're making fun of their father being this stuffy old man. Okay? So that's the kind of image that we have here, full of high sentence, you know, huffing and puffing with all of these wise sayings, which are really just cliches, but a bit obtuse, a little, a, a bit out of it, not totally out of it, but a bit out of it. At times, indeed, almost ridiculous. This would be Polonius if Polonius really had that much insight into himself, which, of course, in Shakespeare's play, he does not. Almost, at times, the fool, with a capital F, fool, who also is a stock character in Renaissance drama. So, and a number of plays, including Shakespeare's plays, have a figure known as the fool. And then we have a very, very famous pair of lines. I keep saying that, I know, but it's true. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Well, okay, I grow old, I grow old. Well, that takes us back to his earlier worries, right, about growing bald. There's a bald spot that he's, he's worried about, people talking about. Or even when he gets all dressed up in all of his fine clothes to go out of a morning or perhaps in the afternoon, he uh, wonders if people are thinking, oh, but his arms and legs are thin. You know, and the voices that are dropping down so he can't quite hear them in the next room, are they really talking about him? And so on. I grow old, I grow old. I mean, in one sense, who cares? I mean, that's part of life, too. But he's obsessed with this, and he's obsessed with superficiality. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. You know, I had no clue what that meant for a long time. And then when I was in graduate school, I had a professor whom I mentioned here earlier in connection with Hopkins. You know, I, I said about Hopkins that he uh, only came to be known after World War I and really got an appreciative audience. This professor was the, the guy who wrote the first book about Hopkins, the life and, and poetry of, of Gerard Manley Hopkins. That wasn't its title, but that's what he did. And uh, he had been at Oxford back in the 1920s and 30s himself, Oxford, the university, the professor had. And he said what this was a reference to was the way in which men would wear their trousers it had just newly become fashionable to have cuffs on your pants. That up until that time, men's trousers were just straight without any cuffs. And tailors called it rolling the trousers, the bottoms of the trousers, because that's what you would do. You'd take the, the trouser and you would fold it up a couple of times and then stitch it in place to create the cuff. OK, now, what's the significance of that? This, at least according to my former professor, uh, who was there and presumably would have known about such matters, um, was what all of the young dandies did 
You see, the ones who wanted to have absolutely the sharpest and most stylish clothes to appear in. So what's going on here then is, notice the old rolled draws attention to the, the tension between these two lines. I grow old, I grow old. And we can almost insert a therefore. A therefore, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Again, obsessed with, with youth, with aging, and so forth. Shall I part my hair behind? You know, part it way back here and then comb it forward, maybe? Will that cover up the, uh, the bald spot? Do I dare eat a peach? Another very, very famous uh, line, very often quoted. Dare I eat a peach? Well, what happens when you eat a peach? Shall we eat a peach? What? Nobody here has ever eaten a peach? <laughs> you don't like peaches? Okay, <laughs> fair enough. What, what happens when you try to eat a peach? Yeah, exactly. If it's a ripe peach, the, the juice is going to come dripping down. And uh, my God, it could get on your cuffs. Possibly even get in your lap. So, canned peaches. Canned peaches. <laughs> canned peaches, that'd, that'd be safer, you think? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but they don't taste quite the same, do they? The, uh, so, so dare I eat a peach? And notice the, the choice of the peach. I mean, this is not an apple because an apple uh, doesn't uh, uh, provide the same prospect of that kind of juiciness spilling down your, your hand and wrist and down your arm and your clothing. Do I dare eat a peach? Well, he won't even dare something like that. He won't really dare anything, will he? In an effort to reach out and grab at life. I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. Now, if you've seen pictures of men at that time, they wore white flannel trousers and walked on the beach in them. I mean, we'd go down on, you know, in our bathing suits, but, you know, they wore their white flannel trousers to walk on the beach. Um, I have heard the mermaid singing each to each. The mermaid singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. Well, how does he know that the mermaids won't sing to him? Well, he won't even dare. If he won't dare to eat a peach, he certainly will not dare the possibility that if he approaches a woman to whom he is attracted, that she might sing to him. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black, which is also a wonderful figure here. Because it's, it also, the, the waves blown back by the wind, it's like a, a woman's hair being blown in the wind, isn't it? Which is carrying out further the mermaids associated with the sea, with the water. And also, of course, the mermaids are female, just like the sea is female. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed and seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. And here we're talking about fantasy, aren't we? This is how he has lived in his fantasy life and his fantasy world about women, okay? So I have heard the mermaid singing each to each is really fantasy, isn't it? This is something which has only taken place in imagination. I do not think that they will sing to me. 
I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. Okay, this is all fantasy. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us. Human voices wake us from our reverie, from the fantasy, from the daydream, or from the dream dream. And then what do we do? Then we drown. Okay? Notice the uh, ironic reversal here. I mean, you would think of drowning in the sea, but he's not drowning in the sea. He even, in imagination, is going down into the chambers of the sea. These are underwater chambers of the sea. By sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown. But then when the voices of real people jar him back to waking reality, he drowns. Okay? Once again, totally ineffectual and presumably lifeless in a sense, in a sense of the term, lifeless. Well, this is a very interesting poem and as I have said, one of the most famous poems of the, uh, of the entire modern or modernist period. And I would like to briefly take you to one more just because there's a point I want to make. Okay, The Hollow Men. Just turn over for a minute to The Hollow Men. Notice how it begins. Look at the epigraph up there. Mr. Kurtz, he did. It's a line out of uh, Heart of Darkness. Okay. This too, from Eliot's point of view, is about the condition of us in the modern world. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. We're hollow men. It's a very famous image, by the way. We're hollow in the sense that we're, we're nothing but surface. And there's nothing really inside. There's no depth. Nothing real inside. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Leaning together, headpiece filled with straw, alas, our dried voices when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry glass, or rats' feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. Notice everything is dry, 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 dry. No life. We're dead. We're dead inside. We have lost our spiritual center. And in losing our spiritual center and centeredness, we're hollow. And we just go along leading very superficial lives. Um, Eliot, by the way, was, as you no doubt have realized by now, he was a genuine uh, cultural conservative. And he believed that in the modern age, everything was passing away. And in large part, it was passing away because we had lost our faith. And by faith, he meant, yes, religious faith, but he meant more than just religious faith, that we'd lost our faith in ourselves, we'd lost our faith in our culture, and therefore we had lost everything that gave us life and energy and real meaning. And so that's why he keeps using these images of dryness, like spiritual dryness, not only physical dryness, but the physical dryness is really metaphor for the spiritual dryness. And, uh, and, and that we are the, the hollow men, the stuffed men, as if we've, you know, you take something hollow and you stuff it, right, with straw in order to make it look like it is living, but of course it isn't really living. 
And so this poem goes on and on with all of these kinds of images in section three. This is the dead land. This is the cactus land. Here's stone images raised. Here they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star. Is it like this in death's other kingdom, waking alone at the hour when we are trembling with tenderness, lips that would kiss, form prayers to broken stone? The eyes are not here. There are no eyes here, and so forth, in this valley of dying stars. Sightless, empty men, okay? Triviality. Here we go round the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow, for thine is the kingdom. Between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response, falls the shadow. Life is very long. Between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent falls the shadow. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is, life is, for thine is the. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Not even with something spectacular, like an explosion. The world simply ends with a whimper from the hollow men of the modern world. And this, of course, is preparing us for what we're going to do next time with the wasteland. Okay.